Well, it's officially 7.04. I call that North Country Live time. And I would like to say good evening and welcome everyone to North Country Live. And thank you for joining us tonight. We're really excited to be presenting uh, this evening of history uh, with Tom McGrath. If you, if you were able to join us last week, uh, he talked about the all of the different happenings that happened on our Ticonderoga campus. And it was amazing because during different times, if we had looked out the window, at Ticonderoga, we might have seen George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or, or, or a lot of other folks. And tonight he's going to be talking about what happened where our Malone campus sits. Um, now we have a lot of people joining us tonight and in an effort to keep the sound quality as good as possible, I'm going to ask that everyone stay muted. However, if you have a question, please type it into the chat and at the very end, I'm sure Tom will save a little bit of time to be able to answer any of our questions. So without further ado, I'd like to present Dr. Thomas McGrath. Here we go. Tom, we yeah, can you hear me? Now, yes. You can hear me. Yep, you sound good, Tom. Okay, thanks. All right, well, uh, once again, thanks everyone for uh, watching. And last week, uh, if you were here, we, we looked at the history of Ticonderoga, as, as Selena just said. And um, my whole idea, premise behind this, this set of uh, presentations is looking at the history of uh, the sites where our school, our campuses are located. So we're not looking at the history of, the, of North Country, but we're looking at the history of the grounds. And uh, tonight we're gonna be looking at Malone, which uh, is a beautiful campus, uh, old brick buildings. And we're gonna talk about uh, what that site was used for, how the mill operated. And when it comes down to it, history is about people. And one of the advantages of, of studying a site, a place, local history, uh, these people really come to the forefront and we can kind of get to know some of them almost uh, personally. So I hope some of that comes through tonight. For those of you that don't know, I know we have a lot of people from Malone here, uh, where Malone is located. So I have this map here and you can see the red dot in the upper left. And the reason I position them, this map uh, this way is so you could have a good uh, landmark. You see Lake Champlain in the center of the screen. And we talked a lot about Lake Champlain and, and the role that it played in history. We talked about Ticonderoga. So uh, another reason I wanted to include, frame the map this way is uh, Malone was first settled by people coming over from Vermont. And actually much of the North country here was settled that way, transplanted New Englanders. You know, once people stopped shooting at each other after the French and Indian War and the American Revolution, uh, this became a safe place to come up and settle. So that's really, really when you start to see um, settlement moving into the region. And Malone really gets its start early 1800s. Um, and just like we talked about last week with Ticonderoga, the importance of water. So uh, this is the Salmon River, which runs through Malone. And, and this is sort of acts like a, a magnet to attract settlement because once you have uh, water, particularly water that drops steeply, it can drive uh, water wheels to, to drive industry. So that's what you're going to see here. And Malone quickly uh, begins to grow. Uh, you have sawmills, tanneries, um, obviously farming. You have an iron mine here in the early 19th century. In 1808, it becomes the county seat. So it becomes a very important spot politically. All legal transactions will take place um, in Malone for Franklin County. By the mid 19th century, the railroad arrives and not just the tracks, I'm talking about the industry. There were uh, machine shops here. There was uh, facilities that, uh, that, that built uh, equipment for the railroad. So we start to see Malone really uh, become this booming uh, economic area. And of course, I love my photographs. We're gonna look at, at quite a few tonight. This photograph was taken uh, probably right around the turn of the century. And this is the Salmon River. And I love this picture because it shows 
exactly what uh, I was talking about, the power of the water. We see the dam in the background and the water is coming at us. This photograph was taken, we'll come back to it in just a minute. Uh, this, is, this is one of the bird's eyes that we talked about last week. And I'll, we'll look at a different, uh, some more pictures of uh, this bird's eye view. But the letter P is uh, the bridge over the Salmon River. And that's exactly where the camera was located looking to the left. So basically upstream of the Salmon River. You can see all of the industry that by the 1880s had emerged around this, uh, this area. So here again, uh, looking upstream, most of these buildings are gone today and the trees have sort of reclaimed the banks. With one exception, if you look in the background, back left, there's a, a tan building. Um, this building, was the Horton Grist Mill. It was built in 1853. And it is still there. It's on the National Register of Historic, Historic Places. Uh, but this is what it looks like today. And uh, when we get to the end here, I'd really be curious to ask some of the Malone folks or anybody that has information on this. Uh, there was very little I could find online about the efforts to preserve it. But the idea is uh, to stabilize it and uh, to, to sort of save it as an education center and, and rebuild it. So I know it looks in rough shape, but you'd be surprised what people can do now as far as restoration. Uh, if you, even if you have a shell of a building, there's, there's a lot of hope. So I just wanted to mention that in case the preservation is still going on. So here we have that bird's eye. And for those of you that uh, didn't hear my description last week, uh, this was a big trend in the, the late 1800s where they would send artists out to make detailed sketches of every town and then they would they would draw it as if you were up in the sky and people could purchase it and as I mentioned before if you have an old house in Malone or you just want to have some fun with this drawing you can find uh, buildings that are in this drawing today and yeah, a little close-up section of sort of the center of Malone you can see lots of detail here. Uh, you can see the railroad coming in from the lower left that makes sort of a swoop um, next to uh, the center of town. Beautiful railroad station there as well. So now we focus in on our topic for tonight, which is the area of uh, the Malone campus known as Ballard Mill. And we'll zoom in a little bit more in just a second, but. Uh, just the detail in this. You might see what looks like uh, teepees all over the place. And um, what I think that is, is this was harvest time. And I, that's generally what the farmers did to dry out their hay. They would uh, rake it up and then stack it for it to dry before they baled it. So if you look at this bird's eye, literally almost every section of it has these stacks of hay. And this is the region that we're gonna be talking about. You can see the old um, Parmalee Sawmill, and I'm, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but this was the mill that stood on the site before Ballard Mill, and lots of uh, really cool details here. So we see the mill pond, and you can see the logs floating. There was a boom, which is probably a rope or a chain that was strung across uh, with barrels or some type of uh, flotation to keep the logs from going over the dam. They would be diverted into the sawmill, and they would be cut in just like last week when we, we saw the stacks of wood. Uh, we've got the, the stacks of uh, planking here coming out of the sawmill stacked and there are some warehouses here as well. And I guess this, this area was really troublesome for flooding. Uh, this, I think it's Willow Street that crosses over on the right, that little bridge. Uh, there, I read several accounts that uh, chunks of ice would kind of build up and uh, the the water would back up and would flood this all the houses in this area. So that was an ongoing problem. And at other times, the, the Salmon River, uh, it froze almost to the bottom and town workers would use dynamite to, to break up the ice. So um, it's just funny when you get into the minutia of, of what was going on. So this is, I'll take, uh, this is a look at what Malone uh, appeared like right around the same time that we're going to be talking about the Ballard Mill. And these photographs, I mentioned it last week, you can go online and you can 
find really high quality, high, resolu high resolution photographs. And the details are just so cool uh, to, to kind of get into. Uh, we have a guy here on the left wearing a, like a bowler hat and he looks like he's talking to a very fat cat, which is rolled on his back. On the right hand side, not only do we have all of these American flags, but I saw way in the background, a uh, Union Jack, a, a British flag. So this may be because of the proximity to Canada and also the, the larger circle here. When you zoom in, you can see this appears to be a young woman in a long dress, kind of looking back at the camera. So these, these photographs, we, um, we need to think of them as, as historical documents because it captures uh, a moment in time that uh, we can go back and we can kind of just uh, glean all this information out of. So uh, of course I wanted to go back and find this location and I just had the idea that this was Main Street because it just looked like uh, the center of commerce and everybody had such pride in their buildings. It, it was not, it is actually Mill Street which is a side road that heads off and this is that exact view today. So I was surprised how many buildings were still there. A lot of them have been altered. You can see uh, there's the comparison. Thank you, Google uh, Street View. But if we look at, compare at some of these details, we've got that building on the left. The stone steps are still there, the original ones. And if you look closely, it almost looks like the edge of that granite has been rounded off from a century of people just uh, going over it. And you can see that the front of the, the building, the windows have been bricked up and it uh, looks like it's a restaurant now. I'm sure some people know what this is. On the right-hand side, we've got the, um, that distinctive uh, window grate, um, which was located, uh, looks like it's been altered, but that's the same exact uh, window grate. And I think in the background, that building with the giant green arrow, I think that is original to the period. I think it's still there. And if you look way in the background at the end of the street, that roof line lines up in some of the windows. So that could possibly be original as well. Uh, but I think the most interesting thing of this picture is on the right, is if you look at that gray Chevy parked right in front of a no parking sign, almost hit it actually. So lots of details you can find. So Jay Ballard, obviously important to our story. And I really, uh, the more I read about him, uh, the more impressive he became. He was, from what I could tell, uh, in many ways, uh, progressive in, in forward thinking. And we're gonna see some examples of that today. He was born in Mexico, Mexico, New York, uh, which is out West. And um, he's gonna be born and raised there. And at the age of 17, his mother dies. And shortly after he takes a job as a traveling salesman, he's selling, selling dry goods. He's gonna travel all over New York state, all over New England. And if you ever know a, a salesperson, um, there's a certain quality that you have to have to be successful. You have to be a, a people person. You have to be able to communicate well. So he, he probably had those skills to do this job for 10 years. And I'm sure he honed these skills as well. And he also, you know, got a good sense of, of what life was like for people in the region and what were, what were the needs. He um, gets married to a Malone girl named Elizabeth or Bessie Skinner. And he will relocate to, he will locate to Malone uh, in the 1880s, and he will start a uh, wool mill, not on this original spot, but in 1891. And he becomes, you know, one of those people in the community that everybody knows. He's just so active. Um, I listed a, a few things here. He was a member of the St. Mark's um, Episcopal Church. He was a Freemason, Chamber of Commerce, Malone Club, Malone Winter Sports Club. Um, he served in the National Guard where he was elected captain. I, I thanks to Brian O'Connor for sending this book down. It had a photograph of Company K of the National Guard from Malone. And this was his unit. And thankfully someone marked all these names and there he is. So oftentimes you'll, you'll hear him referred to as Captain Ballard. And he didn't, he didn't serve in the war, but he, he did serve in the military. William Skinner. Now, 
you never know where you're going to go when you start on a project like this. There are connections that just kind of come out of left field. And William Skinner is important to this story. Uh, he's a Malone boy. And after he graduates from Malone High School, at some point he ends up in Connecticut and goes to college down there and ends up staying there, gets married, has children. But he is going to be the brother-in-law of John, uh, Jay Ballard. So um, we have this connection here. And uh, Will, William Skinner also has experience in the woolen industry as well. And it's with William Skinner that uh, Ballard will go into partnership when they construct the Ballard Mill that is now the Malone, Malone campus. And uh, William Skinner has a very, uh, very strange demise. Uh, I was trying to figure out what happened to him, um, but he becomes president of the Colt Firearms Company in 1909. So this was a huge gun manufacturing uh, company. And think of the timing. War is just about to break out in Europe. And someone wrote of this time that Skinner was actively in charge of affairs of Colt during the war. So this is World War I. And the strain placed upon him by this responsibility would tax his physical strength and his mental nerves. His two sons and son-in-law were in active service during the war, but this was not realized by him until the war had ended resulting in a nervous breakdown. He never truly recovered from this and his health would continue to grade to degrade over time. So this is just, I, I'd love to learn more about this. So uh, he has a, suffers a nervous breakdown. He goes down into uh, the West Indies to try to recover. Uh, he collapses down there and he uh, dies in 1922 at age 67. So like I said, you never know <laughs> where, where you're gonna go with some of these stories, but Skinner, is going to be the partner with Ballard in this endeavor. So again, we'll go back to the site. Uh, this waterfall is going to be uh, what's going to drive this mill. And in 1901, construction begins on what will become Ballard Mill. And they make several changes to the site. The dam is going to be essentially rebuilt and strengthened. And one of these buildings, and I think it's the largest one on the left, uh, it's a great deal for you real estate people. Uh, it was purchased for $50. And someone dismantled it and brought it over to Catherine Street in Malone and rebuilt it, at least using the lumber uh, as part of a livery stable. So uh, it was kind of a repurposing at the time. So uh, we're going to see a lot of activity here. And we've got some descriptions of. Uh, this uh, mill being built. So from the paper in 1901, the brickwork is all up and the floors are being laid with expedition. These rest on immense iron trusses and are of heavy two by six timbers set on edge and spiked solidly together. Over them is to be uh, laid a smooth floor of inch material. So the, the fact that it's being built with iron trusses, this was, um, this was a modern building. A lot of uh, construction was now incorporating iron. The Mount Washington Hotel was, uh, was built that way. It has iron trusses. And of course, um, within a short period of time, we would start to see um, metal and steel being used for skyscrapers. So uh, Ballard, that was a good move to use this heavy material. So uh, in the mill itself, and here we have the, the dam in the foreground here, uh, in the large building, we have uh, looms which are going to operate on the lower floor and the upper floor is going to be for carding, which is uh, taking the wool and basically uh, cleaning it up and turning it into thread. So all of this stuff is being done during the beginning in August of 1901. And here is a view from the other side. Now you can notice there's two buildings here with a small one in the, in the center. The one in the background was for the looms and the carding, the heavy production. The one to the right would have been used for sort of finish work, stitching, dyeing, and uh, the offices are located uh, right on the, the, uh, the building that's closest to us on the lower floor. And you can see that entrance there. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a while. So uh, again, we'll go back to 1901. 
newspaper, the pants factory, which is the, the building on the right, is rapidly nearing completion on the inside. The workroom upstairs being practically finished and uh, the gearing for the sewing machines now being put in. The room is light and airy with whitewashed brick walls, steam heating fittings and hardwood floors. Uh, in the bottom, they also talk about it being a shipping room as well. The buildings will be handsome, spacious and convenient in every way and the plant the most valuable addition to Malone's industries made in a generation. Our people have reason to look, for, look upon Mr. Ballard's efforts with gratitude and he deserves their cordial assistance and support. So uh, when you think about factories, especially during uh, like in urban areas, you think of oppressive places, uh, you know, stifling heat, poor ventilation. Uh, this factory seems to be, a, be built with that sort of progressive mindset of the condition of the workers. And when we, we see what those conditions were, um, people seem to like to work here. And, and maybe some of you folks um, have, can speak to that later if you, uh, if you know anyone that's, that has relatives there. In March of 1902, the factory opens. And there's a real sense of optimism in Malone. Not only is Ballard's Mill opening, there's a, re a paper mill that's been um, refurbished and, and open. So you start to see this real economic boom. And we have a little op-ed I thought we kind of need to, to read here from that time. So this writer says, our isolated location makes our fine village unique and its comforts and advantages are so many that strangers often speak of them. We who live here are the only ones who do not fully appreciate them. By planning ahead for it, we can make Malone in the future the most thrifty and most beautiful town in Northern New York. So we have uh, this period of, of growth in the early 20th century. Here's a beautiful shot looking uh, up on the hill behind Ballard Mill, you can see that in the center. And yeah, notice how open everything still is. So here's a shot of what they call the business section of Malone. And what it was really surprising to me was to, to get a modern view of this. And it looks nothing like it did uh, right around 1905 or so. Um, I believe from, from what I kind of read bits and pieces that there was a big fire at one point that destroyed a lot of these buildings, but uh, you wouldn't even recognize that this was, except for the church, that was the only way I could line up the shot. So as business begins to expand, there is the need for labor. Um, every year, the production exceeds the previous year. And they, they talk about, uh, the paper talks about how it was tough to keep up uh, with the, the demand for these new goods. It really gained a reputation. They were shipping to all over the United States. And uh, this ad, 25 girls wanted at the Malone Shirt Factory at once, supplied office, help paid while learning. So Ballard's looking for helpers. And this is about, the, the mill employed about 100 to 125 people. So this is pretty substantial. The placement of this ad is a little bit unfortunate. And I promise you, I did nothing to alter this next image. This is exactly how it appeared in the paper. Uh, right next to a little piece that said, Anselm Lincoln, who was employed in the mill of J.O. Ballard and Company at the end of the middle finger so badly mutilated last week in a picker, which he was running as to necessitate the amputation of the finger about halfway between the first and second joints. So, um, and how much incentive that was to go work at the mill. Nineteen twenty-one, another advertisement. I love uh, old advertisements. Um, I use them in class all the time because uh, you know they they kind of reflect the period. And what do we see here? Thirty years of service, uh, 1891. Remember, that's when Ballard started the mill before he moved up to the new location. Uh, in 1891, we started to make Malone pants and are still making them. We also make the following all wool garments, and it lists a number of things. And these do absolutely reflect what's going on uh, in America at that time. We've got uh, not only men's business suits, we've got golf suits. And Ballard was a big advocate of the Malone golf course, which is still there. And uh, we've got uh, lady sports suits. That would have, this is the age of the new woman. So this is, this is uh, 
showing how these times are changing. And also something called auto robes. And I had no idea what auto robes were. I thought maybe for mechanics, but they were these. So if you're looking for a Halloween costume this year, this would be a good choice. Uh, back in 1921, most of the automobiles didn't have heat. A lot of them were open, like you know the, the carriages would have been. And this would have kept you warm and also protect you from all the dirt that came in. So uh, this was what an auto rub was. So we think about the 1920s and the explosion of the automobile industry. Here's a you know, case in point how uh, this automobile industry really kind of uh, affected so many, had so many ripple effects in different directions. So Ballard starts to get in on that. Um, this is a tag probably... Uh, Later on, you can see the um, Ballard and Company. And this was really high quality stuff. I just wanna go back to this ad one more time. If you notice in each corner in the upper side, uh, the upper part of this ad, there's a man um, who's uh, sharing wool and it says all wool in a yard wide. That was a slogan that was sort of a saying meant high quality and Ballard adopted that and he used it. But keep an eye on that logo, we're gonna see it again. So here is what would have been a catalog photograph of Ballard's uh, products, probably the first Untuck It shirt. And I believe uh, everything you see there was produced at Ballard's and you would have seen this and, and ordered it. So here is the delivery. I love this picture, the delivery truck for J.O. Ballard and company with the spare tire on the side. And uh, this was taken somewhere in Malone, but if you look closely on the door, probably hand painted, there's that logo. So this marketing idea that Ballard was pushing forward uh, using it on his delivery truck. So now I, of all the photographs, I think this, this is the one to me that uh, really just makes me think, makes me wonder what's going on here. This is, this is the Ballard workers, uh, factory workers, but there's a number of questions I have here. You know, you, you employ 125 people or so. What was significant about this group? Why did they choose this group to pose? Uh, when, what was the circumstances around this? Who are these people? Uh, it's a lot of these things are just mysteries, but we have a lot of great detail. And this is a photograph you can find online as well. But here are the faces, some of the people, and you can tell that this, factory was well lit because that backlighting almost washes out a lot of the details. So we see a mix of men and women and uh, different ages as well. Close up of the group on the right. And there's some details in here. You have to look kind of close. Uh, the man in the, the back center, it looks like he's holding an object. It might be a bobbin or a shuttle. So uh, that was, I'm sure, uh, arranged by the photographer. The man on the far right in the back, he looks like he's wearing a suit and tie. So maybe he was a manager or foreman, a salesman, who knows. Uh, but the guy in the front sitting down, it looks like he's holding a wrench. And you would always have a machinist on duty, you know, to, to fix anything that went wrong with the equipment, which um, did quite often. So just a great picture. And I just love that we have these faces looking back at us through time. Another photograph uh, taken a little bit later. And again, this was staged, obviously. You've got the product in the front, but lots of details. The gearing uh, hanging off the rafters here. We've got what appear to be bins. And of course the faces. This, this must be summer because everybody looks hot and they got their sleeves rolled up. And I love the two women sitting down. They look like they're, uh, they're in charge here. So that ad for 25 women wanted, learn as you, you know, get paid as you learn. Uh, quite possibly these two were the ones teaching those women on how to do this. And it was very complex. Um, when you start to get into it, all the skills you had to do, they would work long days and they would have an hour off for lunch unpaid. But when they were working, they were standing. There was no sitting down. So it was, it was tough work.
1918, we have a description of the mill. Surrounding grounds are handsomely laid out, making it with the well-lighted and sanitary buildings, one of the most attractive industrial establishments to be found anywhere. Um, so this was, I think reflects Ballard's forward thinking, you know, building with this modern material, uh, the, the lighting, the ventilation, this had electric power. So that dam was running generators. So you had electric lights in the mill. And you also had uh, something simple as fire escapes, which really didn't become standardized. Of course, we had the terrible fire in New York City in 1911, the Triangle Street fire, where women were jumping out of a ninth story window uh, because they didn't want to get burned to death. And here in Malone in 1913, there was a horrible fire in a hotel that killed nine people. So fire was a real issue and one of those problems that the, this progressive movement uh, sought to address. But uh, I'm sure there were problems, but the accounts that I read, it seemed like a, a nice place to work. It seems like a real sense of community here. Um, I have no idea. I had no idea how to fit this in, but I had to put it in somewhere. Miss Karina LaFrancis had an operation last week for the removal of a growth in the nose. Dr. Zimmerman performed the operation. Miss LaFrancis has now resumed her work at the jail Ballard Mill in Malone. So <laughs> different times. This was, you know, imagine if you had a medical procedure today and the local paper printed it for everyone to read. Uh, this, this gentleman came up a couple of times and I might, the mispronouncing the last name, Joseph Yops. In 1914, uh, there was a, it says just before noon that the factory shut down and they gave Joseph Yops a $25, uh, $25 in gold for his 25 years of continuous and faithful service. So I, you read again about uh, factory work at, at, during this time in the 19th century and it's, it's pretty, uh, Pretty demanding and there's not a lot of thought for workers as individuals. Uh, so this really stuck out to me. But what, what amazes me is that Joseph Yops, who was a machine operator, he worked at Ballard Mill for over 60 years. Uh, he died at age 84. So think about a place like this to someone like this, that not only did they work at one place uh, but how much of their life was involved in it, 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 how much of their world. So uh, I just thought that was incredible. Okay, I have no evidence of this. Uh, this is all based on conjecture. Maybe some of you folks could help me out. Uh, but when I was researching this, I found at least three couples that were married uh, while working at the Ballard Mill uh, together. So Paper writes, just as we go to press today, we learned that Fred Liebold, foreman in the weaving room at Ballard's Mill, and Miss Julia Brown, a young lady uh, in, in the employee of the company, are to be married today at Rouse's Point. They have many friends in Malone who extend their congratulations and will give them a hearty welcome on their return. 1909, Fred McGuire and Miss Anna Mae Mulhall. Mr. McGuire is a foreman in the carding room at the mill, and his wife has been a weaver there for the past 10 years. Both are valued employees and highly regarded. They receive some very nice wedding gifts, among them a complete set of silverware from their fellow employees. And as late as 1946, uh, Mary Toland and Elmer Bosworth, both bride and groom, employed at Ballard Mill, groom and machinist. So you think about factories and the kind of that cold uh, idea of just machinery, but it seems like there was other connections being made here as well. Now Ballard uh, supported many events and this, was, this would be sort of extracurricular, not involved with the work production, um, but they, I think they speak to this progressive era and his view uh, toward the workers themselves. We have the 1912 Ballard Mill basketball team. Uh, this is not a picture of them, but it is a basketball team from 1912. I'm sure, I, God, I hope there's a picture of that basketball team uh, but this gives you an idea of what they would have looked like. Uh, the lineup in, uh, in 1912, Hickey at center, Bradish and Shanvin at guard, Stone and Robert forwards. Unfortunately, the, the week I read this paper, uh, they had an away game at the Malone Knights of Columbus and they lost 1914. So uh, sad day. And uh, what was really interesting is Mr. Ballard let them 
set up a basketball court on the second floor of the big mill building, uh, probably because of the high ceiling. So next time you go into that building on that second floor, uh, just picture these guys tossing the ball around. Women's suffrage was uh, got the, the big push in the teens and Ballard is uh, a proponent of this. He uh, hosted several what they call picnic baskets to raise funds for the local uh, club for political equality, it was called. It was sort of a local branch of a national group. And I, it was kind of neat how they did it. The, the women would bring baskets and the men would come purchase the basket and they'd reach around and they would pull out a woman's name. And that was the date for the day. So they would sit and they would share that lunch. And the whole idea was to raise money for the women's suffrage movement. Conservation by the late 19th century, this industrial juggernaut had sort of just uh, ripped through America's natural resources. And it was one of the reasons that uh, the, the industrial age was so productive in America during that time. But at some point, people started to look around and say, hold on a minute here. If we keep doing this, we're going to have nothing left. And uh, places like the Adirondacks, um, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, Vermont, uh, the logging industry had taken a huge toll, uh, just ripping out um, massive hardwood. And um, Ballard was one of the first ones to become involved in reforestation. So uh, the paper talks about an experiment in reforesting lands adjoining the village waterworks on the Pinnacle, which is a, a nearby um, peak. He had planted 800 small white pine trees just west of the Waterworks Road. Paper says the little trees look small, but will have a fine place to grow and will be watched with interest. So Ballard actually forms a committee for reforestation. And in 1919, um, he purchases all these little saplings from the State Conservation Commission. It costs $3 per 1,000. And uh, he advertises that if you want to replant, you can come to Ballard Mill and you can buy these trees and replant. So uh, this really wouldn't become popular until uh, probably a generation later, but uh, Ballard is pushing for this conservation. Now this, I think, was the coolest thing that I found out. Uh, the, the workers at Ballard Mill organized a group called the, the Ballard Mill Relief Organization. Now there's no workers comp back then. So if you, like Mr. Lincoln, lose a finger, uh, hopefully you can still work. But if you get sick, if you, if you can't do your job, uh, you're out of luck. So the, this group would put together and for several years in the 19 teens and early twenties, they held a fair. And this really uh, got a lot of attention. And I'm gonna just, uh, I, read this passage because there's so much cool detail in here. So you need to use your imagination. This is the site of the fair, these, these, uh, these green grounds here. Uh, the festival um, given by J.O. Ballard for the Relief Association was Thursday evening. It was a great success socially and financially and proved uh, one of the most enjoyable fairs which Malone people have attended in a long time. People of all classes to the number of probably 1,500 made their way in the grounds and listened to the fine concert given by the Malone Band uh, amid the brilliant lights and decorations which ornamented uh, the place and the music. It was a scene of beauty. Uh, the river and driveways were illuminated with flaming torches and the place where people congregated with hundreds of Japanese lanterns and electric lights. The band played from 8.30 till nine, uh, refreshments were served and then the Grand Theater Orchestra took over uh, and there was dancing in the open air. So this, I don't know, there's something about this image that, uh, that really stands out to me. And the following year, they reported that uh, they sold 115 gallons of ice cream. And uh, you could also have your fortune uh, told by a local uh, psychic. So this seems like a lot of fun and it just, it made me think, just throwing it out there, uh, maybe this needs to be revived in some form, uh, you know, maybe with a, a period band and uh, some sort of festivities on the grounds. I think that would be a lot of fun.
Okay, so I was surprised that I didn't find anyone that died at the mill site. You almost always have uh, fatalities. Matter of fact, I think three, four years ago, a man uh, fell into uh, one of the uh, pieces of machinery at International Paper here and was killed. But um, I could not find uh, anyone killed on site. Uh, there were a few um, what I call mishaps and close calls. And uh, 1903, Ballard was coming out of his office and he noticed one of his bookkeepers, a man named Thomas Creed, who was about 70. And he was, something was wrong. He was standing, leaning against his desk. He wasn't answering. And his, his, I think he had a stroke. He, his one side went paralyzed and uh, he was taken home and he died a week later. Um, August, 1905, there was another accident. A carpenter named Augustus Hamill fell off uh, a roof, not one of these giant roofs, uh, one of the smaller buildings, he fell 16 feet on the way down. He struck an iron beam, landed in a pile of bricks. Uh, he gashed open his head, which needed stitches, cut his face, broke his nose, broke one arm, and knocked several teeth out. He survived, and the paper said he is recovering, but it will be some time before Mr. Hamill returns to work. In 1924, right at this location that you see on the screen, there was a man working on the dam, and he heard some commotion. There was a group of uh, young 13-year-old boys that were swimming, and one of their uh, playmates had, had gone under water, and he didn't come up, so uh, this guy... Uh, ran over, he pulled the, the boy out. By this time, it had attracted the attention of the mill workers. Ballard's secretary and some of the mill workers run out. They grabbed the boy, and I guess they rolled him on a barrel back and forth and got the water out, got him breathing again, and essentially saved his life. So I don't know if Mr. Ballard was accident prone, but he himself uh, had a couple really bad experiences. One took place in 1901 during the construction of the mill. He was, uh, I'll, just, I'll just read the account. Mr. Ballard, while walking around the new mill Saturday in the wind, made a misstep and fell, his left hand landing on a post, which a workman was driving with a huge mallet. The mallet came down on his hand, crushing two of the joints so that it was thought at first that a part of it would have to be amputated this was not done and the hand is doing well. Uh, a couple of years later, 1906, Mr. Ballard is in his office and I'm, I'm not positive of this, but I'm gonna assume that it was behind that big bay window. And he saw one of the Teamsters or drivers of uh, the delivery wagons and he needed to get his attention. And he ran out the, the door that you can see right here and he fell down those steps. And it sounded like a, a nasty fall. He fell head first and hit his head against uh, the wheel of a wagon that was parked right there. Uh, really damaging his nose and knocking out two of his front teeth. So um, the paper reports that within two days, the teeth had been put in with a bridge uh, and he was off on a business trip by Wednesday. So uh, no deaths, but we have a couple uh, just a few uh, close calls here. And just to look at this photograph, if we zoom in a little bit closer, you can see those steps. That was the original entrance to the office section of the mill. And today we see remnants of that. Uh, that circle is where that entrance was. You can see the brick. There was a roof over there at one point. Uh, the steps seem to be, uh, be removed. And the big bay window to the right, you can see the, the um, different colored brick around that. So that's where that bay window, maybe Mr. Ballard's office, not sure, um, but just sort of um, reminders of the past. Uh, 1932, the Olympics are held nearby in Lake Placid and Ballard gets the contract to make all of the US ski team outfits. So here's the US ski team from 1932. And things are gonna go downhill for a couple of years. Of course, the depression hits. In 1934, Mr. Ballard is uh, becoming weaker. He had some sort of illness. I don't know what it was. Uh, he, he worked up until the summer of 1934, coming to the office. But after that, he, uh, he, he couldn't make it out of his home. 
and he died on September 25th, 1934 at his home at 156 Elm Street. I don't know if that building still exists, but that's where he lived and that's where he passed away. And his obituary said this, he was a kind hearted man and his responses to aid to the needy were always prompt and generous. His passing is felt to be a great loss to Malone. So uh, the plant will close for a short time during the depression, but one of the stockholders, a man by the name of Cantwell takes out a, a loan and he gets the operation up and running. And of course, World War II kickstarts the American economy. Uh, what Ballard Mill produces during that time is cloth for the army, that uh, uh, greenish color wool. And uh, they even start making lining for automobiles. But what happens uh, after the war, really the last 15 years or so, is you start to have competition from newer fabrics, synthetics, overseas factories, which are selling at a lower price, and the mill closes in the 1960s. But by the 1970s, we have new life. And there was a, a grant to um, convert the mill buildings into uh, an arts and crafts center. And there's some photographs taken from the 70s of that, that um, restoration or, or rehabilitation of the old buildings here. It's like uh, new pipelines being put in, uh, the roof being worked on here. And this, this might be where the basketball court was just because of the high ceilings. And North Country, um, I believe taught some classes there up until um, about 20 years ago when uh, the campus was moved uh, full time. So if you, if you work, uh, again, some of you Malone people, maybe you're in this photograph, maybe you know people, but uh, this is part of the crew that was restoring the mill. So uh, the mill today, if you, if you work there, if, you, if you're a student, you go, if you visit, you know, just sometime when there, take some, take a moment to think about uh, what we talked about tonight and all the, the things, you know, those echoes from the past uh, that occurred in that spot. So I uh, hope I hope you enjoyed it. And um, uh, if you have questions, I can try to answer them. Uh, but if you guys just want to chip in anything, I'd love to hear it. Thank you, Tom. That was amazing. Um, are there any questions? There were a couple in the chat during. Uh, Kim, you, you're welcome to unmute if you want to ch uh, jump in on those, if Kim's still here. She did ask at one point. I'm there here. Was, I'm, I'm there here. Hi, hi. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really fascinated by this. And by the way, he lived, I think he lived Ballard on, um, it's still there. There's this really stately bunch of palms on First Street in Malone, because I could tell um, that that street is like divided. So you go down it, it's behind the hospital, blah, blah, blah. But you go down it and uh, a lot of professional people live there now. And there's like a little green space in the middle. It's a pretty street. It's um, over there near Ho Holy Family School. If you're like being taken to the hospital or going to the hospital uh, on the Constable Road, whatever that's called, 122. Uh, it's first, second, third street. Third street gets you over to the hospital, but I recognize that house. But I wanted to to ask you a couple of questions. So, um, so that would that I recognize that's where Ballard lived, and all these professional people live there now, and they're taking all those old houses, a lot of them, and they're um, making them into painted ladies. Um, <laughs> Uh, where they're doing beautiful paint jobs and refinishing of the fine points of, of these homes. But um, I wanted to ask you, Tom, if you saw anything uh, in your research that related to um, the stories of the ghosts, because the custodians, the, we don't call them custodians anymore, do we? we the cleaners in our Malone campus, when they were there at night, when everyone would leave, frequently heard noises and when and honestly i'm not nuts well 
some people think I am, but uh, I'm not. Like I'm not like one of these ghosty people, but uh, I'll go in and I'll hear noises there. And the second floor of um, the other building, not Ballard Mill, but the other building, uh, there people have seen a lot of different people have seen a ghost in the one uh, in the one room on the second floor on the left as you get off the elevators. And uh, I was there one night in the middle of summer, dropping stuff off for Sarah Kilby. At like nine o'clock at night and I came in and someone yelled hello to me and I'm not nuts it was nine o'clock at night it was dark it was July 30th 31st I was trying to get a packet into her before I went over to Burlington with some health stuff with my spouse and uh, I heard this hello just like that and I said back hello I'm here dropping something off god bless you be good be kind nice to talk to you I got the hell out of there as fast as I could. And I was stone sober, obviously, and right in the middle of you know, doing a lot of things. So there's all these ghost reports. Did you, uh, and, and I couldn't find anything. I actually tried to look it up because um, Mary Smuts in our business office, her great, great was around at one of, at that drowning in the, in the river um, where she said the kid didn't get pulled out. Who knows? Um, they used to have picnics on Sundays. Did you come up with any of, of that stuff in, in your deep dives? Because there's all kinds of weird stories about bad things that happen. And there's about seven of us who've heard ghosty things, including last week. Kim Ganyo went into her office, nobody's there at the bookstore and her adding machine tape in the college bookstore was had like 17 inches of blank white paper. Like somebody had just sat there and hit whatever, return, 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 return to get that adding machine taped through. So I'm not making this up. It's not just me, but it's mostly like the four, five, six of us who've heard ghosty things. Um, did did you see anything or hear anything as you went down your rabbit hole and you're digging on the Malone campus? Uh, done. No, but I think it sounds like we need to do a, an overnight investigation. there. That would be fun. Yes. Yeah. Right, Tom, I really wanted Mary Smuts and I were drilling down with Kim and Arlene and Karen, and we said, wouldn't this be the most amazing community thing to do on Halloween? Yeah. A ghost tour of our two buildings. Like you could do the historical piece and different people could share their anecdotes and freak everybody out. And then we could have, and we could actually make some money and do some kind of fun stuff. Of course it's COVID yeah. now, so we can't do anything, but. Yeah. That was really great, Tom. I loved it. I love the old Thank pictures. You. I I completely I took screenshots as you did it. I, you're just so oh. amazing. You need to be nominated for Historian of the Year. <laughs> I'm so, done. Uh, as far as the drowning, there there might have been another drowning, uh, but the one that I read about uh, was was not a, a, bad, a sad ending. So, uh, ghost stories. I I didn't really look at modern. Um, any, any modern sources here, and those would have been uh, probably more recent. I was focusing on when these events were taking place in the early 20th century, but I, I have no doubt that uh, there's things that stay. Do we have any other questions? I do, Selena. Tom, thank you so much. It's Joe. Uh, that was a great yeah. presentation. And thank uh, you. wow, um, uh, Kim, Kim really nailed it. You just did a really wonderful job. Thank you. Um, thank you. Tom, the, uh, the photo uh, looking back across the, uh, the dam, it looks like a relatively new photo. Do you know the date of that one? It has the, the individual fishing right in the middle of the dam. I think it's one, one slide back on your uh yeah keep going back that this one. one yeah i i'd say that's mid 20th century um i think it's actually a postcard i think that's that's what it was so a lot of these photographs were 
including some of the earlier ones we looked at were, were actually postcards, but I can't be sure, but I can definitely um, find out. I'm, I'm struck with the fidelity of the, the reconstruction of the campus. I mean, the buildings are so recognizable, but I'm also, you know, to your point about the fair, if you look over on the bank, there are tents and there look to be a number yeah. of people sort of milling around in that area um, in, in ways that, you know, suggest some kind of uh, an event that people are enjoying the great outdoors. Yes, yeah. And, uh, you know, I think probably, you know, any place located on the uh, water or the river with, uh, with green space uh, is going to attract events like this. And that's most likely what happened here. So, yeah, I don't know. Definitely. Tom, yeah, I actually, I do remember um, that reading about that red building when I was doing the 50th anniversary stories about the college. And that was actually a theater. They would put on stage performances there during the, uh, you know, that sort of art center reincarnation of the mill building. Okay. So that might be wow. what you're seeing there, some activity associated that, with that, but maybe some more folks close alone might recognize that as the same or something different as well. Yeah. And I actually, I think that red building is the oldest building on this property. I think that goes back to the, the first mill that, uh, cause Ballard uh, reused a couple of the buildings that were there. And I think that's one, you can see that in the bird's eye. So that's, that's even older than the Ballard mill itself. Kim raised your hand. Go ahead, Kim. Um, I had another question that I put in the chat. Um, so Churubusco is past Chattagay. Chattagay is 14 miles from Malone, where I'm sitting right now. And then Churubusco is another, it's in Clinton County. It's another 12 miles. Was, were there dorms there? Because I can't imagine that the woman that, I guess I remember you said she, I took a screen snip of it as you were, it was an intriguing. Uh, they got married in Rouse's Point, which is 35 miles from me. So that's about 50 miles. That probably would be their home community. 50 miles from the Malone Ballard Mill. And uh, did, did they have dorms or some ability to sleep there? Because I can't imagine with no mass transit or automobiles that they would be commuting daily back and forth. That was, um, that was really my question. That, and I know that um, when I read Farmer Boy, that Wilder story, I was intrigued that Almanza Wilder uh, his older siblings went to the Franklin Academy, now the middle school there in uh, behind the armory, and they actually boarded there all week. Uh, and then they would go home to Burke, which is only about six miles from our seven miles from our campus because they didn't go back and forth every day when they were at school. Yep. So uh, were there were there some kind of living accommodations or maybe around on William Street and snaking around toward River Street? Were there places where people could board during the week? Did you come across any of that? No, but it's, it's, quite, it's quite possible because if you lived in an outlying town and you were looking for employment, it, it's just an obvious choice to kind of come to the, the, the place like Malone that had jobs and where there are workers that need a place to stay, there's always people willing to you know, rent and uh, whether it's an apartment or rooms. So uh, I don't know. So that's, that's a good question. Do we have any other questions for Tom? You're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat there, Tom. Uh, I also wanted to not make, I don't have a question, but just a, a nod to those, those wonderful newspaper clippings from the era you know i've come across that too when i'm looking back at historical stuff that you find the most you know you know trivial kind of thing in the paper about you know so and so took a trip to vermont yeah. to see their grandchildren this yeah. week yeah you uh -huh. know but you know they talk about all politics is local but you know in those days all the news was local <laughs> yeah. and part of me kind of thinks that you know that Sometimes people talk, I'm a former reporter, those that don't know, people talk about the, kind of the demise of local news, that maybe if we went back to more of that kind of, here's what people in our community are doing, people might 
you know, find more value in their local news. But yeah, I just love to read those kind of you know, little clippings. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hilarious and just fascinating. Yeah, Thanks it's, it's easy to get distracted when you're looking at old newspapers because, you know, there's old ads for cars and uh, products that make no sense and just funny little uh, articles and jokes. So, uh, but yeah, it's 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 neat and it's accessible. Everybody, you know, you can get on get online, just Google a, a newspaper, historic newspapers, and you can just sit in your computer and look at them and old photographs. So, you know, have fun with this stuff. Tom, uh, yes. one more thing. I'm intrigued and I'm going to try and find out how he didn't know that his son was deployed in World War I. That is, that is nuts to me. I, I just, yeah. maybe there was some estrangement issues there or something. I don't know. No, but there's, there's got to be more on him out there because he was a big, big deal to be president of that company. So um, I just didn't have time to fill in the backstory and it kind of, took me too far off our beaten path for Ballard Mill too. So, but it, it would be interesting to find out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? I do, Selena. If Tom, not, this is probably, oh. so Tom, this is Joe again. This is probably a setup. So feel free to, to punt on, on answering it. <laughs> so, but I, I'm, it, it's a combination uh, based off of your uh, presentation last week, you know, where, and, the, and this week. So you have two really thriving communities, um, right? And with uh, deep historical roots um, and, uh, and having um, the natural resources and the, and sort of other um, resources that would that would really uh, help them propel. And in, you know, they went through a period of uh, a great rise and now um, they seem to both position to be able to, to once again have some of that, um, I don't wanna say old glory, but opportunities are there. Do, do you, and I look, I look over the border in Canada and you see towns that are very much like, you know, they have the historical trend, they share the same culture. And in many ways they have continued to thrive and be very um, uh, pop, well populated economic development. And I'm, I'm wondering if you've ever given that some thought around what's the difference in that borderline, you know, between what's just over the border in Canada and, and New York sharing essentially the same geography, you know, the same river basins, the same resource. And, and uh, it, it is, it's a, it's, I said, Tom, it's a setup question, but. <laughs> well, I, I think it probably, you know, leads back to uh, financial restrictions in a lot of ways. Um, a lot of these towns need, need money combined with, it has to really start from within. People, I think, in a community have to want to make change. And even that op-ed from 1905 that the people, everyone loves Malone except the people that live here. They don't, well, <laughs> paraphrasing, but, you know, the people that live here don't appreciate what you have. Uh, uh, Whitehall, New York is a great example right down the street from me. Uh, it is one of the most historic towns in the United States. So there's so much history and old buildings there. It has... Uh, highways going through it to bring people in and it's just collapsing and crumbling and I'm just thinking you know if you just got a group together and I know it's easier said than done but uh, it has to come from within to make those connections and really you know make something of what you have and make other people want to believe in it too I don't know if that answers your question but yeah and we have yeah I just see we have such great potential and and I don't mean it's not a it's not a slight. I love the communities we live in, but there, no. there's like that next day. Maybe the economists among us can answer that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Can I can I say something as somebody who taught human geography? I think it has to do, Joe, with cultural diffusion and mobility. Um, 
the thing that I noticed when I moved here was that there were plenty of people who had never from Malone or Chateaugay even gone to Canada, except for the people who had Canadian relatives. And I was dumbfounded by that because I love to take my day road trips and go here, there and everywhere across whatever border, uh, international or state. And um, that was a large part of it. And what human geographers, Tom will, and, and cultural uh, anthropologists will say is that it's because economics drive mobility. So if you don't have the money to leave or you have to tend your farm or your cows or your, or your, or your factory job, you don't go too far. And it really wasn't in my opinion until the 2000 teens that I saw my neighbors actually starting to venture forth to uh, the villages, to Myrtle Beach, to places where they bought second homes or bought wreck vehicles after they got out of their jobs, their 20 year jobs. And um, I was struck by that. And I had a lot of conversations with my husband and my children about, because coming from Florida, everybody's mobile because nobody's from Florida, except for the four people who were from there. Uh, and, and I was, as a historian slash human geographer slash weird person who looks at things, I'm like, wow, these people really need to get out of Dodge. Now they have, but a hundred years ago, not only could you not leave, but you didn't leave. Um, and I did find that the Canadians, when I ventured over the border into both Quebec and, uh, and uh, uh, regions to the West, not as much as into Quebec, that they were more, uh, mobile than than we were and more knowledgeable about their their realm maybe that's part of it i don't know they they, they i call it root bound i'm done most of the uh people that uh lived in the, the malone area uh, and i'm talking about the 1950s uh uh were, uh, went to uh, Messina, where uh, uh, there were a lot of opportunities for employment with, uh, uh, because of the uh, seaway, the uh, opportunities for employment. But that whole region, that more in that direction. Mm. Thank you. What wonderful conversation. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. I'd like to thank Tom so much for another wonderful presentation and a big special thanks to our North Country Foundation, our North Country Community College enrollment team and marketing team, and a big special thanks to our sponsor, um, IP of Ticonderoga. Um, if you have uh, plans to join us in the future, it's wonderful. We have some great presentations coming up. We have managing the recreation in our high peaks. We also have threats to our Adirondack waterways and climate change. And in April, we're going to be looking at our backcountry preparedness. We're going to ask ourselves, why do we garden? And then we're going to learn all about birds. So we hope that you'll be able to join us for our future presentations. And thank you so much again for joining us here on North Country Live. Have a great evening, everyone. <laughs>